God's chosen in this place and to uh, gather for worship however we can do that. So I'm glad you're able to join us. And don't forget uh, that if you have uh, joys or concerns that you want to uh, put our way when it comes time for our community prayers, please uh, drop us a, a, a comment on Facebook and uh, we'll try to incorporate that into the live aspect of our prayers. So I'm glad you're here. Um, this morning, uh, there, was, there was an unavoidable uh, contact that I, that I was able to make. It was a good thing, a very good thing. I want to preface it by saying that, that, that every single tree, palm tree that I walked past that had fruit growing had its own hive of honeybees working over those blossoms and those, and those pieces of fruit. Uh, so for all that we thought was wrong with our environment, there are certain aspects that have recovered uh, and it was a disease that was killing the honeybees, but it was so prevalent that every tree I walked under, I could hear it humming, and they all sounded the same. So they were singing in harmony. I like to look at it that way. And uh, we got to enjoy the sunshine and the water. And the, 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 the harbor is absolutely overflowing with some kind of a hatch right now. So there was a feast going on for the predators, and there was safety being sought by the prey, but they were breaking the surface. and and jumping clear of the water at times to avoid the thing that was trying to eat them. But um, it was uh, nothing but life, and I guess that's the way I'd like to leave that. So it was, it was a good walk. So um, your announcements that you saw playing, now if, if you didn't get a chance to see those, it means you didn't see them for the last hour. They've been running streaming for the past hour. So those are our revolving announcements that get changed each week. So. Um, some of them are the same and some are different, so th those have been rolling for you. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to highlight on our uh, donations to St. Vincent de Paul, this is a, a ministry that's been going on in this church for a very, very long time, so a good partnership between St. Vincent de Paul and the uh, Congregation of the United Church of Christ, uh, that we don't often talk about how many donations have been made. The, the hard materials, the boxed macaroni and stuff like that, we don't have a way of knowing. Uh, they're added up as poundage when they come in to uh, come into St. Vincent de Paul's food shelf. But uh, there are a lot of monetary donations, and and we sometimes it's a good thing to uh, to step back and just look at how much has been given uh, that the St. Vincent de Paul can go down to Harry Chapin and buy surplus foods for pennies on the dollar. So if you notice that so far this year, and we're just barely through halfway. Already $3,185 have been given to St. Vincent de Paul to be able to supplement the hard donations that they're receiving of canned goods and, and non-perishables. So uh, that's a good thing. When you think about it, you can get about seven or eight cents per dollar, uh, seven or eight pounds of food per dollar that you donate. That's, that's a lot of food that's been donated so far this year, and it all comes in very handy, and I'm sure it flies off the shelves, especially with so many folks who are out of work or who can't work, who are ill or have a family member that they're caring for, uh, this, is, this is a time when they're especially relying upon those, the, those food sources to be able to uh, keep their houses fed. So thank you for those donations and keep them coming because they're always, always needed. Um, the one, another one that I wanted to highlight that I forgot to last week is that you may have read in the announcements that our leadership team uh, met uh, in, on July 14th, which was our, our regularly scheduled meeting. And we, as we promised, were talking about reopening the church, whether or not that was a prudent thing to do. And uh, we had set a guideline for ourselves that is in close proximity to the CDC that we wanted to see a two-week uh, downtrend on new cases in Charlotte County before we would consider opening up even on a limited basis. Well, we know that those numbers are going up and up and up. Just yesterday, uh, it was reported the day before there was 100 new cases in Charlotte County alone. So we're going up by three or 400 every two weeks, which is not a downward trend, it's an upward trend. So the prudent decision was to not open at this time, and we're still gonna look at it and decide when we can possibly have people back here in a limited basis with many precautions in place. I think we're getting used to those precautions, and that's a very good thing. Uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's something that's going to keep us all healthy and it's going to continue to downward trend the spread of the disease. So it's a good thing to do. If there's someone who thinks that their personal freedoms are being 
uh, diminished by wearing a face mask or using hand sanitizer. I'm sorry, that's absolutely not the case. It's a case of, of health and well-being and compassion for your fellow citizens in this county and in our state and in our country. So uh, please consider altering your opinion to make that match uh, so that we can get through this pandemic more quickly. So you can see for yourself that there are a lot of folks who have uh, birthdays uh, and we don't have any anniversaries that we were tracking, so we have a lot of birthdays. Uh, so you can, you can uh, wish those people well, happy birthdays as you wish. Um, and get to them however you can. Some of them have, uh, some, some of them don't have email, and some do, but uh, there's a lot of, lot of folks here who, who need happy birthday wishes, and we wish them all happy birthday as well. So um, I think that's about the end of what I am going to highlight as our announcements for today. So let us continue our praise and worship of God. In a social justice moment one year ago, we told you about the program Witness at the Border, a group of volunteers who stood vigil and reported happenings at the Child Immigration Center in Homestead, Florida. Many of the children there were separated from their families by Homeland Security agents when their families sought asylum at the border. At that time, some of our church members participated as witnesses at Homestead. Today, we want to share with you a trailer for an upcoming documentary in the fall entitled Asylum Seeker. It describes what was happening at the border before COVID-19 struck the U.S. Since then, both adults and children able to cross the border have been forcibly deported before their asylum applications. They have been taken on planes to Central America without any clear homes to which they may return. Those who remain at the border in Mexico suffer squalid conditions in camps where the COVID virus is spreading rapidly. We invite you to stand with the group Witness at the Border in their efforts to make hurtful policies toward asylum seekers known and to work and pray for immigration reform. People love to look away from this. We're trying to come up with things to, to get people to look. I was helping people connect with attorneys once they got to the U.S. I was helping people look at their paperwork and understand it. I was opening up programs to bring warm food for them at the bus station um, when they were dropped off by, by CBP and USCIS. They were dropped off at 3 in the morning with nothing to eat and their children asking for food. Asylum seekers do not have lawyers. That's why it's only at 1% of people who are able to pass because they are representing themselves every single day at all five hearings. But since we are hitting away, there's two lawyers for over 2,000 people. MPP has stopped the flow of people and now they're here and this is the evidence of what's happened. They've had to create a refugee camp. and hardship. This is, this is a moment in history. We have to be prepared to testify about what happened. So we're witnesses, testigos, and we're, gonna, we're going to be ready for that tribunal that finally holds people to account, holds all of us to account for what we allowed to happen here.
Good morning. This morning I'm reading Psalm 105, verses 1 through 11, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make his deeds known to all people. Sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord. Dwell on all his wondrous works. Give praise to God's holy name. Let the hearts rejoice of all those seeking the Lord. Pursue the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wondrous works he has done, all his marvelous works, and the justice he declared. You, who are the offspring of Abraham, his servant, and the children of Jacob, his chosen ones. The Lord, he is our God. His justice is everywhere throughout the whole world. God remembers his covenant forever, the word he commanded to a thousand generations, which he made with Abraham, the solemn pledge he swore to Isaac. God set it up as binding law for Jacob, as an eternal covenant for Israel, promising, I hereby give you the land of Canaan as your allotted inheritance. The word of the Please join me in the call to worship. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny mustard seed that carries the life of a tree. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny pearl of great price that we would give all our stuff to have. The kingdom of heaven is like a fishing boat filled with catch, good and bad, with fisher folk, wise to recognize the good. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the unison prayer. Holy One, you call us to find your kingdom already hidden in our world and in tiny transforming possibilities. In beauty that calls us to surrender all, in complicated choices that call for wisdom. Reveal yourself here in this moment and heighten our senses that we may find you and join you in building this kingdom of love and hope and peace. In the name of the one who calls us to seek, Jesus Christ, the Christ, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
calls us to seek and find the hints of the kingdom in our world and to nurture its growth among us. We will use our gifts, tithes, and offerings to rebuild the body of Christ. Your offerings are now received. Let us dedicate our offerings. Grow these gifts in your love. Bless our offerings, our hearts, and our hopes in your love to make us worthy of your work for your kingdom in heaven and among us here, even now. Fill these gifts in each of us with your goodness. Amen. Genesis 29, 15 through 28. Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when the evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. So that's a pretty interesting story. Uh, Jacob, we know his name means trickster, because he got that name when he tricked his brother Esau out of his inheritance. Not only did he trick him out of his inheritance, he imitated his brother so that he could get the blessing of his father, which meant everything that his father had was inherited by the younger son, which is not done in the Jewish tradition as we're told in, in those days. So Jacob tricks with the help of his mother, we have to admit that, uh, his father, Isaac, out of the inheritance that Esau would have had. So Jacob is running for his life, has run for his life, and his mother has told him, go to this land where you can take, uh, find a wife for yourself out of our relatives. So that's where we find Jacob. He's at Laban's home, which is a relative of his, a cousin. And Laban, we are told, has two daughters. So Jacob goes and finds a well, warm, warm welcome from Laban and, and uh, explains to him what he wants to do, that he's there to find a wife. And, Laban says, well, I, I'm not going to make you work for nothing, so I'm not going to, you know, have, just give my daughter away, so what are you going to give me in return? And so uh, Jacob says, well, I'll work for seven years for um, Rachel, which is the younger daughter. So I think in Laban, Jacob might have found his match because he had no suspicion that Laban was going to pull a fast one on him, which is exactly what he did. When the time came for the contract, for Rachel to be fulfilled and for him, for her to become 
Jacob's wife, he sent in uh, his, her sister, Leah, instead. Now, there's a different way of, of reading this. What Mary shared with us um, was that, that Leah had weak eyes. Now, in the version that I read, it says here, Leah's eyes were lovely. So, you can take that as you will. One of the, one of the two is going to be true. Uh, possibly both, who knows. But uh, Rachel was graceful and beautiful, so that's why Jacob was attracted to her. So Laban sw switched Leah and Rachel on the night that uh, Rachel was to become Jacob's wife. And so when, in the morning, uh, he finds Leah with him, and he says, what did you do to me? And Laban explains, it's not our custom, it's not our tradition to have the younger daughter given in marriage before the older daughter. I'll tell you what, you can have them both, which wasn't unusual in those days. You can marry them both, have them both as your wives, and they eventually had a happy relationship and many children with each other. But you work another seven years and I'll give you the, I'll give you the younger daughter too. But he got to be with Rachel, the one whom he loved, whether it was for her beauty or the fact that she just they got along better, who knows, but he had Rachel and Leah as his wives for another seven years as he worked for Laban. Now, we aren't told this in this story, but when Jacob gets ready to leave, he tricks Laban into giving him half of everything he possesses in order to go uh, back to his homeland. So, Jacob gets tricked. He meets another trickster. Laban has a plan. Jacob has a plan, and they fool each other. But in the end... Leah and Rachel are married. Jacob has two wives. Like I said, they had apparently loving relationships because they had children together that were going to be more numerous than the stars. Remember that passage last week that, that Jacob is promised that his offspring will be more numerous than the sands on the beaches. So um, this begins to work out to be God's plan instead of Jacob's and Laban's and Leah's and Rachel's. So Jacob begins to change. So he's, uh, he's finding that his way of tricking is not God's way and that there may be a better way to do something. He was fighting against tradition, but he should have known that tradition to begin with and been a little better informed, but possibly he did not. He was blinded by the love that he formed for Rachel when he met her. So there were things that kept him from recognizing what was right in Laban's eyes and what was right in Jacob's eyes. So what goes around comes around is what I call this, that Jacob begins to learn that being a trickster is not really the best way to treat other people, uh, especially when you love them, when they're family, when they're related to you, when they're, they're beloved by you, that it's really not a good idea to trick them because that's going to turn around and come back and, and get you in the end, as it did him. So there's, there's evidence uh, further on in, in the book of Genesis that that Jacob, his attitudes began to change, and he began to treat people better and differently. So, uh, he learned an important lesson, that how he treated other people mattered, mattered, and uh, he was taught the same lesson. So, I think that the lesson for me that I take away from this is, is to always remember that, that this isn't about my plan, this isn't about our plan, this is about God's plan on how we get through all of these things, no matter what we're experiencing right now, that there will be another side of this. And when we come to the other side, it won't be because we've tricked somebody into it. It won't be because we've defied law and gone out and just infected everybody we want to. That's not how we treat each other. But it is about compassion and love and caring and about God's love overall. This is God's plan, not ours. So now I want to share with you a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter yet again this week. This makes the third week we've been in the 13th chapter of Matthew. And there's a good reason for it, I hope. that the, We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to share with you a reading from the 13th chapter, uh, various verses toward the end of the chapter. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field, it is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When someone found it, which someone found and hid, then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Bought that pearl, excuse me. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He asked them, have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. May God bless us with deep understanding. Thanks be to God. So this, like I mentioned, is the third week we've been in the chapter 13 of, of Matthew. So we've had a lot of parables thrown at us in the past three weeks. The first week was the parable of the sower who extravagantly goes out and throws seed everywhere, and some of it takes root and some doesn't, and some has a really large return. And then the parable of the wheat and the tares where the good seed is sown and then an enemy comes and casts the weeds among the good wheat. And then the explanation of those. We, actually, the explanation of the wheat and the tares comes smack dab in the middle of the passage that I just read. The verses that are omitted are where, where they ask Jesus for the explanation because they got caught on that wheat and the tares. They, they really didn't understand it that completely. That's why Matthew offers an explanation because it isn't completely obvious. Not, nothing in a parable is supposed to be completely obvious. If we take it at face value and only look at the words that have been said, we're going to miss probably some of the deeper meaning. And as I said, shared with you last week, Tom Long in teaching about the parables said that they're meant to make us dig deeper, find the meaning that's hidden underneath the surface, much as our parables did today. So we find in the past three weeks that we've had seven parables about the kingdom shared with us, that the kingdom of heaven which is another way of saying the kingdom of God is like these things. It is not exactly these things, but this is language that describes what it might be like if this were the accurate translation of it. So uh, we have seven parables that come in three sets, uh, really three, uh, three sets, one of, of two, but two singles, two doubles, and a, and a single again. So there's... A, there's there's meaning to this, that there's a reason why there's seven parables lumped together in this, in this one chapter. I'll let you look up the reasons for those, but um, I want to start with the end of the verses that was, that was shared in Matthew 13. I'm going to read them to you again. After all these parables, Jesus asked the disciples who are listening to him, have you understood all this? Now, he's, after, he's had to offer an explanation to two of them. Uh, two of the more lengthy parables. Uh, and they answered, yes, we understand this. And then he said to them something that I think is key to understanding what the parables are for. They are teaching tools. He said, therefore, every scribe, and the scribe in Jesus' day was someone who knew intimately the intricacies of the law of Moses and could interpret for people how they were supposed to follow those. The Pharisees ensured the enforcement of them. Well, the scribes were interpreters. They were teachers. They were professors. And they taught people how to interpret those laws and how to, how to untangle them so that they might become useful in people's lives. So, th therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, I thought that was a phrase that stood out for me. Every one who hears these parables is becoming a scribe, a teacher about the kingdom of God. That's an important thing for us to hold on to, at least I feel it is. And when you are that scribe, that teacher, that professor of the kingdom of God, the vision of those things, what they're like and can, and can interpret those for other people is what the meaning is beyond the parable, 
you become like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure, out of his treasure, what is new and what is old. Now the very end of that verse that I read reminded me of something. There's always a tension between tradition and innovation. The church has always dealt with that. Phyllis Trickle wrote a a book called The Great Emergence that has in there her rendition that every 500 years the church has a garage sale for the things that they no longer need, the things that no longer serve them. So that leads me to believe that those traditions, I will call the old things, being one of them, the old are the traditions that we have. And I believe those traditions, when they are established, speak to the times in which they are established in. So sometimes those traditions become historical and sometimes they become practiced way too long to be useful anymore because things have changed, circumstances have changed to make that particular tradition no longer relevant. But it still remains as part of the history of the church. It still remains part of the history of how life was lived in covenant prior to our current times. Now that new is difficult for me because there is absolutely nothing new that I can say about any passage of scripture that has been written. I don't know of many preachers who will admit that we just are recycling and offering a different perspective on something that may have been read like I'm doing for you right now. How it strikes me today is how I'm preaching it to you. So that new thing may not be brand new, but it may be something that we're reminding each each other of. It may be something new that we're gonna consider trying, like this virtual relationship, this virtual worship service that we're a part of. The liturgy has not changed, so the tradition of the liturgy is not changed. But it might, it just might at any given time when the need arises for that to happen. I thought of something, and, and this is, every once in a while we have to go through our closets and our, our drawers, our, our, our dressers and stuff, and, and get rid of things that, that are no longer uh, either fit us or fit to be worn in public. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of a pair of blue jeans that I had when I was in college. I wore those things as long as I could, so the knees were beginning to wear out, and there was, in the mid-thigh, there was a thin spot happening, and they were, they were just so comfortable. When I put those on, I just felt like, ah, all is right with the world. But after a while, two things happened. They became so threadbare that they were no longer decent to wear outside of my house, but they no longer fit me any longer, because that was... 30 years ago and five inches around my waist. So I can't wear those clothes that no longer fit me. I can't use them anymore, even though I love them. Kelly and I often have these conversations when before I moved down to Florida, before we came down here to begin this ministry, I had my closet filled with T-shirts, again, all the way back to college, and some of them were just so threadbare and so full of holes that they weren't fit to be worn outside the house, and many of them weren't fit to be worn inside the house. So I had to throw all those away, but each one of those old t-shirts had a meaning for me because many of them came from races that I had run for charitable causes. So although the thing was no longer wearable, the meaning behind it was deep for me. And so it was painful for me to throw out those things, actually put them in the trash, recognizing that there wasn't another person on the face of the earth that would be caught dead in that t-shirt or that pair of pants. But to me, they have deep meaning. And I still remember some of them. And they were good causes. One in particular was one for uh, the Statue of Liberty. When they did the last restoration of it, they had road races for like three or four years to help pay for that. And uh, that was a good experience because I was helping with the tradition of my country and something that it held dear to be able to renovate it. So, what is old and what is new? Sometimes they go right next to each other, but it isn't always a comfortable relationship because that thing that is new may be something that someone has suggested, well, why don't we try this to make this work? When the old is standing right there going, well, what's wrong with me? We've been, this, we've been together for 500 years. What's wrong with that? Well, that tradition was established in a time than when it was relevant. And sometimes we let go of those things. But each one of us 
who is a disciple, and, and this is the twist for me, it's not necessarily a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's a disciple of the kingdom of God. We're learning about the kingdom of God in these parables and what the meaning might be for us. So everyone who has become a teacher who has learned about the meaning of these parables and what they speak to the current tradition is like the master who brings out treasure, both old and new. So the parables, I want to talk about those individually for a moment. The seven different visions of the kingdom is, is the way I term it. Uh, the two of seeds being cast and one having the weeds right beside, thrown into the same field. And then the ones that we encounter today, which are more current for us. The measure of the, the uh, smallest of seeds, the mustard seed. Now we have, we have a beautiful vision of that. Anyone who's been to Sunday school, who've been to church camp, who have grown up, have encountered this mustard seed. It's usually more prevalent in, in church teachings when it is Jesus saying, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move this mountain, you could speak to this mountain, it would have to be removed because of that faith. This is a different mustard seed. So the mustard seed gets sown in the field by intention by the farmer. And as it grows, it creates shade and branches for the birds of the air to nest in. It becomes something very good, even though that mustard seed in Jesus' day and in our day is not something you put on your table to eat with your hot dogs. That's not the same kind of mustard. It's an invasive species that will ruin the crop of the field. But in this particular case, this parable, the crop is the mustard seed, and it has good purpose. We had a, in Bible study on Thursday, we all brought out our own invasive species stories. And for me, it was Japanese knotweed, when, which looks like bamboo, but when it makes its way into a, an open field, you no longer have grass to mow. Now you have Japanese knotweed growing everywhere, and it's really hard to get rid of. So this invasive species, this mustard seed, would have been like that Japanese knotweed to a farmer in those days. So, but it has a good outcome. So that's the twist that Jesus puts on this, that everything has a purpose, that even this invasive species has a purpose for providing shelter for the birds. And then the parable of the leaven, the yeast, which a woman takes and mixes in with three measures of flour, which is roughly equivalent to 60 pounds of flour. And uh, all of it was leavened, mixed it in thoroughly until all of it was leavened. Now that's an extravagant and destructive use of that flour, that amount would have fed an army, not literally, but clearly 60 pounds of flour, when you put that yeast in there, you're gonna end up with enough for about two or 300 loaves of bread. So it's unreasonably extravagant, but she takes this measure of, wheat, of yeast and puts it in with this flour and mixes it completely together. And the yeast eventually transforms that flour into something else, which is useful for sustenance. Bread was one of the first things developed that was universally seen as nutritious for human, human beings. It provided a lot of nutrients, a lot of sustenance that they could use, and it was easy to make, and it was easier to store. But when that yeast was put in there, yeast for the purposes that Jesus was talking about was a corrupting force. It changed that flour into something that was useful, but it could no longer be used for holy purposes. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread does not have yeast in it. So when that bread, when that flour is turned into bread that is risen because of the yeast has been processed, it can no longer be brought in for holy use in the temple. So it's seen in some ways as wasteful because then just anybody could eat it. It was no longer holy. But it still has a good purpose. Doesn't it? Think about all those people that are fed. This might have been some of the basis of the feeding of the 5,000. This might have been a consideration of the multiplication that God did of those loaves and fish to feed the 5,000, that extravagant thing. Even the people who weren't entitled to receive that food received it. And then the kingdom of heaven. Those two, those two parables are about corrupting forces, things that we think are good things, but a farmer or a housekeeper, housemaker back then would not have thought to be very good. They were wasteful, they were invasive. They changed something from its original intent into something else. Remember that point specifically. And then we encounter two parables. The first is of a treasure hidden in a field. 
that when someone finds it, he goes with great joy and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, I have to confess to you for a moment that I am a nerd when it comes to the television watching. I remember watching an episode of, of um, Antique Roadshow. Maybe you've watched that before, and maybe you enjoy it too, but I remember back in 1997 watching an episode of the Antique Roadshow. I believe it was in San Diego, California, and there was um, a woman who had brought in just a nondescript, seemingly nondescript small end table that she bought when she bought her new house. She went to a garage sale and saw it sitting there for $35, and she said, that's exactly what I need. So she took it and brought it home. She cleaned it up a little bit. She didn't refinish it. She just rubbed off some of the decades of dirt that had accumulated on it. And then two of the appraisers for the roadshow were, were almost standing on their tiptoes when they came up to her. Do you know what you have, is the question that they asked. Do you know what you have? And they proceeded to tell her it was a table that was made in the mid-1700s by a cabinet maker in Boston. Uh, it was simple, but it was inlaid with many different kinds of wood and very ornate when you get down below the dirt. And then they asked her the question, the, the question that always matters on the Antiques Roadshow, do you have any idea what it's worth? <laughs> and you know that they're setting her up. She said, well, she said, I, I think maybe two or $3,000. And they said, well, we think we can do better than that. They brought to her, these were antique dealers who knew their trade really, really well. And they told this woman, this table since it was made and it still has the label on it from that maker, on the open market today would go for around $600,000. It's a good thing she was sitting down when they told her that. So something she bought at a yard sale for $35 ended up being something that was worth 600000 Nowadays, you can't get away with that as easily because people tend to know what they have or someone has come along and picked them already of their really important stuff. So... And then there's the, the merchant who's looking for that one fine pearl, and both the merchant and the one who finds that treasure hidden uh, accidentally are willing to give everything that they own to be able to, to accumulate those things because they're so valuable. So how is this about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? Well, sometimes that kingdom of heaven can change things from an intent or a form that we think they should have, the corrupting of those things. When the, when the kingdom of God vision comes into us, we begin to be changed into something else, possibly something we never envisioned to have happened. And sometimes when we're changed, those old things become new. Those old traditions are given away to have something that's probably more valuable. So, from that place of thinking that God corrupts and that the kingdom of God corrupts and changes us in ways we could never envision to be necessary in our lives and, and worthwhile to give up everything that we own in order to get them, more value than all of our stuff, more value than all of our opinions, more value, valuable than even our own selves. Those are the kind of things that Jesus is trying to portray in these parables of the kingdom of heaven. I happened upon this, this story that's told by uh, Father Michael Renninger, who is the pastor at St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in Richmond, Virginia, which is a cathedral. He tells a story about meeting a woman named Thelma when he came to that parish in the, in the mid-90s. She had been there for a very long time. She and her husband were leaders in the, in the diocese and in the, in the parish and, and were beloved by everyone. And so uh, she came to him one day and was telling him her history about when they first came to this church. Back in the 1950s, the late 1950s, the bishop of the diocese decided that forced segregation was not compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though it was legal, he decided that it was no longer a practice that he wanted his diocese to have. So he began closing down some of the parishes in Richmond, Virginia, the small Roman Catholic churches, which were predominantly African-American at that time, and telling people they need to go to a different church. He was trying to plant them into com uh, communities that were predominantly white. So uh, the, way, uh, the way Father Reminger te Reninger tells this is, have you ever done something bad with a good intent? 
And that's what this, this bishop did, is he closed down the, the generational churches for the African-American community in Richmond, Virginia, and integrated by force the white churches. So she's told a story about when she first, she and her husband first came to the church, she came in and liked the look of the place. It's a cathedral. She was only in a church before, but this is a cathedral. It's grand, and she was taking it all in. She found a pew that was empty where she and her husband could sit down, and when she and her husband sat down, the couple on the other end of the pew got up and moved somewhere else. And this happened every week for about uh, six months or seven months. And then finally, people stopped moving, and after years, they integrated their ideas and their attitudes and their opinions and found that they actually found, fell in love with each other and had a really wonderful experience in this parish because of it. But people began to move because they didn't want an African-American couple sitting in their pew. It took a long time to get over that and a long time to appreciate them. So the, the bishop in that case was trying to take an old tradition, a tradition that had been in the country for over 400 years and change it into something new by force, which isn't always the best way to do it, I'll admit. But it was something that was done with good intent and eventually had good result. So many of the traditions that we have in our country that no longer serve us, we need to consider whether or not it's time to replace that, to cherish it for what was and have hope in what is yet to be, to establish new traditions that in a short while for us will seem like the old traditions, but for people who've held on to the other traditions such as racism and white supremacy and segregation and just not community-based things, will find that they are upset when they encounter this. But if they will just open hearts and minds to receive this new tradition, and understand that all people are equal in God's eyes, all people are beloved by God's eyes, there isn't a thing we can do in this world to be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's how Paul writes it. No matter what you come up against, no matter what things you get as preference already, when those things are changed, they don't change the relationship you have with God. They don't change the relationship you have with each other. But they are changed for the better. So I think that's where some of the conflict is coming in our country because some of those old traditions are being challenged and not everybody likes it. But I think if we just try something different, consider something new that the master has brought out of treasures, I think we'll find that our faith is deepened, our love is deepened, and our traditions are deepened. Now, this Thelma was a teacher in the public schools, which were still segregated at those times, and she was facing a, a class, a high school class of African-American students, and they were talking about the civil rights movement as it came about and how it might have changed things. And the students made a couple of um, interesting comments that she said, that one of the students said, we have to speak truth to power. That speaking truth to power is transformative. But Thelma cautioned them. She said, yes, speak truth to power. That's necessary for change of all systems. But always remember to speak love to hate. That takes a lot of work and a lot of courage to speak love to those who hate you so that they too begin to realize that they are loved by the same creator, by the same people who are speaking love to them. She said that's much harder work because usually what you get in return is hate to begin with until that transformative love of God takes hold and changes one tradition into something new. It's what speaks to the church. It's what speaks to us who are disciples of the kingdom of God. How we are operating now is going to be transformative, but it's also going to be difficult. But we must keep one thing in front of us, all the time. We speak love to hate. That is the only way anything will ever change. Praise be to God. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Isaac. There are many weary and worn people these days, and I think that song brings a lot of hope and a lot of peace and a relationship. One of the, one of the traditions that I mentioned you, we found in some of our prayers, um, especially the ones that I was able to speak and, and some of the reading that we did together was uh, you saw the word kingdom instead of kingdom. One of the traditions that I was, was shaken in my world is when I went to seminary and they started changing the language from kingdom to kingdom. But they explained the change. Kingdom is about power. It's usually about men having power over someone else. When you change that word to kingdom, it creates a relationship of family, not of power. Kingdom. We are all related in God's eyes and in God's creation. So we come to our time of looking for our concerns and our joys to be shared with one another. You've read, you can read these for yourself. Uh, Some of the ones that we've been praying for for quite a while. And there is a lot of injustice. There are a lot of law enforcement officers and first responders who are being exposed to hate by others. And so their lives are in jeopardy, but there's just as many demonstrators who are being exposed to hate right now too by those who are caring for them. Uh, We saw the video at the beginning, and right now you know that there's a hurricane or now a tropical storm that's coming through Brownsville, Texas, and Brownsville is where one of those detention centers is uh, located. Um, So they're on top of the squalid conditions that they're living in. Now they have to live in flood waters as well. So we'll pray for them to be whole and helpful. Brian and Armando continue to recover, and many of those folks there we, we, we have prayed for for a while. Uh, we have the cause kept in our records, but we don't talk about the cause. We just talk about the people who need our prayers. Oh, there's a big one. Schools reopening. It's such a conflict um, being created, uh, and there is no answer yet. There's conversation going on, but it's usually orders that are given rather than uh, asking opinions about how this should be done from the people who are actually in the classrooms who are doing the work and the parents of those who are sending their kids. Lauren continues to recover from her stroke. Uh, Diane had a very good outcome from her cataract surgery. I didn't ask the question on Thursday if she's going to have another one. Usually they come in pairs because we have two eyes. Um, Charlie and Carol are back north. They arrived safely, so that was an answered prayer. Uh, But we need to continue to pray for them as they find their way into families' lives safely. Uh, Dennis is undergoing chemotherapy. Is there another? Oh, there we go. So I don't see any new ones uh, popping up on my, on my text. So prayer for joy. Uh, ah, yes. <laughs> You're going to see some pictures in, soon in the newsletter. And so read the newsletter, look at the newsletter. But the construction at the front of our building has begun. We, we can now see the foundation of the church. We knew what it was theologically, but now we see what it is physically. And that's in the process of being, of being rebuilt. So uh, that project has begun, and, and Kathy Francis is going to have a lot more to share as that goes on. We're gonna, our front entrance is going to be torn down until mid-September. So uh, it's probably a good thing that we're not asking people to come back to church yet that, because we don't have a proper entrance to bring them in, a grand entrance as we're creating, thanks to you guys giving your donations for that. So um, that is a joy that our... Our, the front of our church, the look is going to be different. So you talk about traditions that change, that it, it will serve better the communities that we have that are coming to, to be with us for worship when that happens. Um, I'm trying to, trying to decipher a shorthand list for prayers here. Uh, I think it's Barb Schock Snyder. Um, for uh, Deb to be in trust and not... No, 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 that's Barb Smith. I get that. She only put the S in there. So we have two Barbs. <laughs> so Barb Smith asked for, for Deb to be able to be in trust and not in fear with the, the terrible things that are happening weather-wise and, and drought-wise and too much rain. It just, it's just not a balanced thing. Yes, thank you, Emmy. Um, 
So we have prayers for joy for the continued construction on our front entrance. And uh, actually, there's going to be, um, at one end, we've, we've got a, a very gracious donor who's going to put, put in a wildflower garden on, that's going to attract bees and butterflies uh, to our, near our entrance. So, uh, and so we're planting flowers, and that's been offered by someone as a donation. So we're very thankful for that. A lot of changes happening. So, uh, so we've got some, a lot of folks to pray for and th- some things to consider in our communities. We, we continue to pray for those cities that are finding it difficult to live um, under their own rules rather than the rules of the federal government and uh, the law enforcement that's coming in to take over those cities. Um, that's creating conflict on many different levels. But the, I, think, I hope that there's a, there's a prayerful and a peaceful solution to having that be helpful instead of harmful. So right now, it's, we're just only seeing the harm. But remember to speak that love to, to hate. That's especially pertinent right now. So we have our folks that we have been carrying with us in prayers, and we have our new additions that we just put on this morning. Uh, we also want to add Tom Wil- uh, Nickerson and Tom Corey for our concerns. Um, uh, Tom is the husband of, of a seasonal uh, worshiper with us, and Tom is a friend of Evie Schwinnemer. And we also want to add Sandy, who is a relative, a sister-in-law of one of our members who is undergoing treatments for cancer. We're trying to find better treatments for cancer. So Tom, two Toms, Tom Nickerson and Tom Corey, and for Sandy, we want to add them as well. So let us carry them with us as we offer God our prayers. Let us pray. O God of creation, God of wonder, hear this offering of prayer and praise as a gift from our thankful hearts. We thank you for the wonders all around us, for the grains of sand, the smell of rain falling on dry ground, for the shifting of seasons and the sounds of laughter. We thank you, God, for one another, for the joys and struggles of relationships that nurture us and help us grow together into relationships that are deeper. God, we thank you for your eternal presence in our midst and for the good news of your deep abiding love for all of creation. We pray for all who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit, and for all who provide care for the needs of others. We pray for the lonely and the despairing, for those who struggle with addiction, for those who feel trapped in situations of abuse, for those who are making difficult decisions in life right now, for those facing down the tide of discrimination. Even as we give thanks, we lift up the concerns that burden us this day. We ask your peace and blessing on all those we have named in this place and whose names and circumstances which remain in the silence of our hearts. God, we pray for your church and its mission in the world. Bless all of your children, O God, and pour out your spirit upon us, bringing healing, comfort, and strength wherever it is needed. All this we ask in the name of the one who calls us forward in faith, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Go forth in wisdom, in hope, in courage, with hearts open to recognize the signs of the reign of God in our midst, and courage to create more space for grace in our lives and in our world. Amen.